the funny thing about raising a generation of readers is that we already have a generation of viewers at our disposal. This is my conversation with Dr. Danny Brassel. What if the truth came in a gel cap and we could just pop it in our mouths and forget about it? Well, it doesn't, and we can't. But we can laugh in the face of reality while plotting our survival. Welcome to the Truth Tastes Funny Podcast. I am your host, Hirsch Repun. And if my guests can handle the truth, so can you. Open wide, folks. Here it comes. My guest today is Danny Brissell. He's often referred to as Jim Carrey with a PhD for the, uh, for the humor and warmth and kind of ingenuity that he brings to his talks, his lectures. He's the author of 16 books. His latest book is called Leadership Begins with Motivation. Danny Brissell, welcome to Truth Tastes Funny. Thanks so much for having me, Hirsch, and, th- and thanks for uh, spreading joy in the world. We need a lot more fun and laughter out there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Speaking, speaking of laughter and fun, when you're approaching kids, trying to inspire them to read, trying to inspire teachers to stay in the game, how do you employ humor? What effect does humor have? Yeah. So, I mean, that's a great question, Hirsch. I mean, I, I think... I always tell people, I think schools do an adequate job of teaching kids how to read, but what goes to teaching a kid how to read if they never want to read? I teach kids why to read because I've never had to tell a kid, go watch TV. I've never had to tell a kid, go play a video game. And I never want to have to tell a kid, go read a book. I want them to choose to do it on their own. I think the problem is what probably you experienced like I did in high school. I had a a teacher and she made us read The Scarlet Letter by Nathaniel Hawthorne. And and no offense to people that love Nathaniel Hawthorne, but the book is about Hester Prynne commits adultery and she has to wear an A on her chest. And I asked my teacher if I could wear a B on my chest because I was so bored reading that book. It just drove me nuts. And I always, I always tell people the research is really clear. It doesn't matter what you read. What matters is how much you read. You know, uh, one of the tips I give parents is the little boy who only reads Captain Underpants is going to become a better reader than the little boy who refuses to read anything. I mean, Captain Underpants is the gateway drug to Shakespeare. But first of all, you got to get the kid interested. And so that's what I'm trying to do. I'm always trying to liven it up and make it fun. I mean, I used to tell my kindergartners, you know, the average adult lasts 15 times a day. The average uh, kindergartner lasts 300 times a day. So your job, kids, is to make me laugh 315 times every day. And they freak out. But we, we just that's why, I, that's why I like the little ones. But it's so true because I look at people like, you know, Mel Brooks, for example, just turned 96. You know, he has longevity and a longevity of spirit and a sharpness and a, a mental acuity. I just am reading his autobiography. It's amazing. It's staggering. And there's a joy that obviously, who doesn't want to be happy? But here's an example. It's a challenge to get my, my youngest child is eight. It's, it's a challenge to get her to read at night before bed every night. But I do know that when she starts doing it, she's full of joy. It's, it's really fun and it's really different. But how do you compete with the devices is that something you come up against? Yeah, so I don't believe in competition. I believe in Taekwondo or Tai Chi. I'm going to embrace it and use that energy uh, to my benefit. So one of the tips I give parents, so I'll have parents, they tell me, oh, they have nothing to read at home. I'm like, oh, but you do. President Bush Sr. 30 years ago signed a very important law in the United States. It said every television set sold in America has to have closed captioning. So one of the quick tips I give parents is turn the closed captioning on the TV. And people always look at me, they're like, well, wait a sec, if the, if the show's in English and the subtitles are in English, what good does that do? I'm like, well, that's a fair point, but let me make a point. Have you ever watched a show with subtitles and not looked at the subtitles? It's very difficult to do. Your brain is attracted to that text. And there's actually research that supports this. If you look at reading scores around the world, the more kids watch TV, the lower their reading scores are in every single country on the planet except for one. The country that has the highest reading scores in the world watches the most TV in the world. It's Finland. 
And people always ask, well, how can that be? I'm like, well, Finland makes really bad TV shows. And so what they have to do is they have to support <laughs> like Gilligan's Island and Hogan's Heroes and Happy Days. And they put subtitles on them. The kids are constantly reading. So that's one of the things I always do. Uh, another thing as a parent, you know, I got three kids of my own and I have a feeling TV's here to stay. But I'm, I'm a big believer in creating positive habits in kids. And so from a very young age... I, I realized my kids were going to watch TV, and so the price of admission is before they can turn on the TV, they have to bring me something to read. So when they were little, they'd bring me like children's picture books. Now they're older, so they'll maybe bring a device and they'll have like an article they're reading on the device, or you know maybe a newspaper article. Or it's usually on the iPad. They'll bring me something now, uh, and we'll read that together. So it's just about how can I? I mean, with your humorous background, that's what I always tell people. It doesn't matter what you read; it matters is how much you read. I mean, when I was teaching high school trying to teach the kids about like language vocabulary george carlin was like the expert with vocabulary the guy yeah. the most brilliant yeah. person on the planet i mean and i could just use routines with my students i'm like i'm not getting on the plane i'm getting in the plane i mean he he talks he breaks yeah. it down and he's just phenomenal and so i would use bits like that i mean um you and I were discussing earlier. I mean, some of the people I love today are like Jim Gaffigan and Bill Burr. I mean, I, I, I'll read routines like this to the kids and the, the kids get excited. about. And I won't finish the routine. And that's another a, another little trick is once you get them interested, then I'm like, well, wait a sec, how's that routine end? And I'm like, well, you're going to have to read it yourself, Oh, but you probably can't read it. I mean, all you have to do to get a kid to do something is tell them they can't do it. I mean, that's, that's the way to do it. Yeah. Yeah, that's a great hook to the fact that reading isn't always about a, a book or what's in a book. You can, there's writing as well. I mean, Bill Burr, for example, doesn't really write down bits. Yeah. He creates bits on stage, yeah. but he's writing them. He's just, he's writing them in a way that's, that's not typical of, of literature, but that's those Carlin bits, the, the prior bits, all of those amazing seminal stand-up comedians were writing, crafting lines on stage and guys like Gaffigan think observational comics that are relatable. I think that's the other thing with education is making it relatable and, and closing the distance between the child and the idea. Yeah. Absolutely. So that they can see themselves in the in the in the idea. Yeah, I feel like every year we try and figure out everything that kids are interested in, and then we eliminate that from the curriculum for the for the schools. It drives me nuts. I mean, let's make it fun. I I want to enjoy myself. I learned long ago I can't teach something if I'm bored teaching it. And so the question I'm I'm constantly asking myself is how do I take lame stuff and make it interesting to my students? And so that's where you know, our comedy backgrounds, I'm, I'm constantly looking for, well, where this, where's the humor in this? And why is humor so important? Because people remember things that make them laugh. I mean, this is, this is one of the best ways to get kids to remember information is to get them moving around and laughing. You know, I'm not going to, I'm not going to do Richard Pryor routines for my kindergartners, but I mean, I, I can do like <laughs> Steve Martin or Lily Tomlin, or, uh, I mean, there's, there's plenty of clean comics out there too, with, for the people that freak it out, freak out about that. I mean, but when I taught middle, I, I taught in the hood in South Central LA, I mean, my middle schoolers and high schoolers, they're definitely not going to be offended if there's some language in something. And I, again, it's not like I'm promoting, but if that's the way the kids are talking, I'm trying to figure out a way to connect to their lives because humor is just a great way. I always challenge my kids. I'm like, well, why aren't you, why aren't you doing your own stand up comedy bits? Or why aren't you, your story matters. I mean, I was doing a training uh, right after Hurricane Katrina in New Orleans. I'm like, why aren't any of you telling your point of view of what was it like going through Katrina? I mean, that's what, that's what humor yeah. is, is different points of view. I mean, Jerry Seinfeld, I love his point of view, but he, he, like you were saying, he gives relatable observational humor that all of us can appreciate. Well, when you mention, you know, profanity and, and some of the dark, you know, bluer humor and stuff, I have to concede that I, you know, I have, I have five kids, all ranging in age, three of them grown, all of whom were exposed to, let's, let's just say my, my taste in comedy. I did take my, well, she's now 25, but I did take 
I think she was 12 when Superbad came out. And I, I didn't realize I took her older brothers and, and her, and I didn't realize what was going to be in that first five minutes. So, okay, I do have some fails, but the, but the fact is they, they all are grown up and growing up with a real respect for language and not throwing around profanity or saying things that are completely inappropriate. And yet they're exposed to subject matter that, that, you know, we might, you know, shy away from if we're trying to work clean, so to speak, in our, in our speeches and stuff. But I think what you say is true. You have to, you have to relate to them and you have to identify and you can't be a prude. I mean, I find myself being a little bit of a prude, even though I, I have a filthy mouth. And fortunately my podcast is, is rated E is it rated explicit. Uh. So, you know, I can say it if I want, but, but it's, it's, it's also this idea that for me, it was always associated with humor. My dad taught me that not, not as a lesson, but it like, he didn't say, now listen, Hirsch, uh, I, you can say, you can say the F word, but only in jest, but that's kind of what I gleaned, you know, that you wouldn't use it in the offensive form. You would use it in the comment in commentary and to diffuse seriousness. Yeah. So, well, and I think you know, comedians are um, always, I think they have the best, uh, they have the best eye for what's actually happening in the world. I mean, uh, you, you were talking about Mel Brooks earlier. I'm like, gosh, if Blazing Saddles came out today, people would be up in arms. And I'm like, but you're missing the entire point. If what you're gleaning from this routine is this, you're focused on the wrong thing. If, if you watch a, an Eddie Murphy routine and all you're focused on is the language, you miss the whole point of the routine. I mean, uh, so I, I, I see the point there. Yeah. And I, and frankly, you know, we can try and shelter our kids as much as possible. I guarantee you that there's nothing that my kids haven't seen on their own that's 100% be- worse than anything I exposed them to. <laughs> We think that kids today, blah, 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 and our parents thought kids today, and then their parents thought rock and roll was whatever. And it's, but when I listen to the lyrics that my teenager listens to, I am pretty like shocked yeah. by it. But I also, but I also feel like, okay, she, she, it's not, it's not strange to her. She knows where to use, you know, put it contextually. So as, as harsh as some of it is, I'm like, okay, I, I don't discount. And working in advertising, I have clients that produce those, you know, music videos and all that stuff. I mean, I, I get the, the social relevance and value of a lot of the stuff. But we do, as parents, sometimes start to slide into this, this kind of crotchety old... <laughs> <laughs> crotchety it, old person. What's important that you're talking about, Hurst, though, is you're having these experiences with your kids. I mean, that's one of the things when, I, when I'm when i going to school districts, I usually work for two days. Day one, I work with the teachers. Day two, I work with the administrators. But on the night of day one, I work with the parents because I think you need all three of those players on the same team. And that's how you move mountains together. And I, I always tell parents, I'm like, hey, we, you know, when I was a kid, I really wanted to watch the A team and my my parents wouldn't let me watch the A team because they they thought it was violent. And so finally they they were sick of me bugging them and so they said, "Well, we'll watch the program together and we'll see if it's if it's a suitable program." And we watched it and if you ever watch the A team now it looks so tame, but uh it's great yeah. because if you ever actually watch an episode, nobody actually dies. They spend like 10 minutes at the end creating this this crazy weapon or whatever and then everybody gets hurt but nobody actually dies in the show and because nobody died my parents allowed us to watch the a-team from that point forward but i i, I look at that with parents i'm like it's not easy being a parent you're trying to figure out how do i shelter my kids how do i make sure that they're uh, they're doing all right and you know you do the best you can but you have to have shared experience i mean i i show my i haven't shown my kids super bad yet because you know i didn't i I watch Superman. I'm like, oh my gosh, and it's so funny, but it's like so much language. But we—that's not to say I'm perfect. I, I've shown my kids plenty of things where there's there's f bombs being flown around there, and I, they always look at me, and I'm like, you know, I don't want you talking that way, but this is this is the way people talk in the world. Yeah. Well, it's it's funny because with with our youngest, I had the idea to to start a swear yeah. jar, right, where it was like. You know, okay, if you hear anybody, any you hear mommy, daddy, your older siblings, anybody use profanity, they owe yeah. you a dollar. You know, 
And, you know, I'm, I'm broke now. I mean, it's like, it's literally, you know, the, and then she'll hear me play something from on the phone and there'll be profanity. And she'll go, oh, that's a dollar. I go, I didn't say it. She's like, I, that wasn't the rule. The rule was if you expose me to it, you're exposing me to it. So, so what, tra tracing your, uh, you know, what you do now back to your childhood, is there something in your childhood that you can ascribe this passion and, and mission that it's, you have? Well, that's ironic, Hirsch, that I'm, I'm considered now America's leading reading ambassador. It's ironic because I grew up hating reading. My father was a librarian. I always hated the public library. It always smelled funny to me. There was uncomfortable furniture. There's always an elderly woman telling me to be quiet. There's always some freaky homeless guy who thinks he's a vampire hanging out by the shelves. I always hated the public library. It wasn't until I started teaching in the hood where I saw a lot of my students didn't have a lot of the advantages I had growing up, where I said, you know what, shame on me. I mean, I was blessed, Hirsch. We were, we weren't, we were lower middle class, but we always had food on the table. Both of my parents were in the home. My parents read to us, in front of us. We had plenty of access to reading materials. And I really became passionate about, well, how do I make sure all kids have access to these types of things? And um, that's really where my mission is. Uh, I've been doing a lot of work now. I kind of, you know, I hate to say this, but I, I don't do as much in America as I used to just because I'm kind of sick of the entitlement. Everybody's like, if everybody thinks that the key word about America is freedom. I'm like, it's not freedom. It's convenience. People like their freedom when it's convenient for them. But they, you know, people don't listen to each other's points of view. And that's why I love comedians. I'm like, oh, they challenge us all the time. You should be looking at different points of view. I'm interested now. I do a lot of work in developing countries like India and Egypt and uh Pakistan, where where I got kids. I was telling people when I when I speak to students in America, I'll see a lot of kids in the audience and their heads are down on their devices. When I speak in India, I got five thousand kids just with their hands underneath their chins, just staring and listening to every word and absorbing every single word. And it's just uh, it's incredible. It's inc incredibly rewarding. Uh, I'm passionate about it. I just think every kid should have the opportunity. And this is where I get excited about technology. Everybody thinks that technology is a bad thing. I'm like, no, it's not. I mean, right now, there's some poor kid in Cambodia, maybe barefoot on a dirt floor, maybe hasn't eaten breakfast. But if that kid has a laptop and an internet connection, that kid has the exact same access as the head of Google. I mean, the world just got a whole lot smaller. I yeah. Mean, think about it just in terms of like, if you if you wanted to do your stand-up comedy, you don't have to be in a New York or an LA comedy club anymore. You can just start posting YouTube videos and somebody can discover you that way. I mean, it's how Justin Bieber got discovered by Usher on, on YouTube. But my favorite example is when uh, it was a journey was trying to find the front man because Steve Perry didn't want to do the reunion tour. They found this guy that did a perfect Steve Perry impersonation in the Philippines. And I'm like, this guy's now the lead singer for Journey. I mean, that, you can't even write something that, that is that great and inspiring. If I do stand up in a late night comedy spot somewhere in the, the bowels of the East Village and I play for, you know, three drunk people yep. and one who's asleep, when I could go on YouTube and have millions of people <laughs> ignore me, that would be that's, you know, the how do I yeah, how absolutely. do I resist that? But yeah, but yeah, you can, technology is not the, the fault is not on technology. It's an amazing thing. We're we're a brilliant species. We we do amazing things. The question is, yeah. what do we do with what we have? What are we using it for? You could do a lot of damage with a hammer, but a hammer's great for building things and putting putting no, boards hurts, together. Yeah. So it's it's all about what mm -hmm. we what yeah. we do with it. The 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 developing countries thing is fascinating. How did that? That was, come that was about? great, Hirsch. I, so this is when I knew I could do anything, Hirsch. So I went to a school in uh, Chennai in Tamil Nadu in, in southeastern India. And I just thought I was there just to visit the school. And the principal, he opens up the door and there's like 5,000 kids in this auditorium. And there's like 20 newspapers and five TV stations. And he's like, oh, today, Dr. Brassell for the next hour is going to teach us the three secrets to reading better. Hirsch, I, I had nothing prepared and I'm on the spot. <laughs> and so fortunately, you know, it's India, even though they speak English, it's, it's a slower English. And so I'm looking at the kids, I'm like, today I am going to teach you the three secrets to reading better. 
who wants to learn the three secrets to reading better? And the kids are going crazy. Yeah. And in my head, I'm thinking, what the hell are the three secrets to reading? And I, <laughs> I came up with a speech on, on, on the fly for the kids. And it was great. That's what I love about speaking because I'm like, oh, I can create a one-hour speech in my head without thinking about it. I, I was speaking once to uh, – uh, it was the Archdiocese of Wichita in Kansas, 750 teachers, and a tornado hit and it took out the power. And so I asked for a flashlight and for the next 90 minutes I did my presentation in the dark. And I'm like, oh, I can do it in the dark. You know, I, I use PowerPoints often and every now and then you have a technology technological snag. And so now I learned the first time it happened, I started teaching all the teachers different songs I'd sing with the kids. And I'm like, oh, this is what I can do now whenever I have a tech snag. And so I, I actually use, I tell, when, if there's ever a problem with my technology, I'm like, I'm warning you right now. If there's a tech problem, I'm going to start teaching you all songs. When I'm doing executives, <laughs> all these guys in suits are all freaking out. We're going to have to sing with this dude. But I'm like, you know, I, I love singing just because try and be angry when you're holding hands singing together. I mean, you just can't. It's like Daniel Tosh had a great routine where he said, Money, they say money can't buy happiness, but money can buy happiness. It can buy you a wave runner. He's like, you are a wave runner and you try and be <laughs> unhappy. Try to oh, be unhappy on a wave runner. Know, but yeah. I mean, and this is, this is what I'm always, teachers are always like, well, where are you getting ideas? I'm like, well, I watch, I watch funny people. Uh, you know, I grew up, probably my favorite was like watching Bob Newhart. I, the, Bob Newhart was like the most amazing. I've never seen a person who could do so yeah. much and he's clean you know i mean I, like i got like yeah and dry, dry and so it's dry just the pauses or so, like when you're laughing at the pauses he's like bill cosby bill Cosby. It's, it's, it's horrible how all my idols you know you, you live long enough your idols turn out to be scumbags but bill cosby growing up was my idol that guy can talk about nothing for 90 minutes <laughs> And you were just hanging on his every word because the guy knows how to tell a story and keep you involved. And, and that's really what all of us are trying to do is how do we tell stories that, that get people interested in what we're – and this is, this is the job of the teacher is how do I get you interested in my story? I mean, I, like when I was teaching, I taught eighth grade special education in, uh, in Watts, uh, South Central L.A. for a year. And it was not special education, Hirsch. It was, it was basically – 16 boys that nobody else wanted to teach. Eight African-American, eight Latino. And if their life wasn't miserable enough, they got stuck with the white dude as the teacher. And I used to sing with them. And every day, they're like, man, this is stupid, man. I hate this song, man. You wore that jacket yesterday, man. You know, middle schoolers always get personal. And then the one day we don't sing. One day we don't sing. And so they decided to get back at me. They, I mean, they hated each other, but they really hated me those first three weeks. And so they decided I was so uncool they were going to teach me Ebonics. And so they made a song and they did it to the beat of This Old Man because I always do I always do my songs to beats. And so theirs goes, uh, this old pimp, he played one. He says gap, but we say gun with a knickknack. This is whack, give your dog a bone. This old pimp went rolling home. This old pimp, he played two. He says kicks, but we say shoe with a knickknack. This is whack, give your dog a bone. This old pimp went rolling home. Then it, it went on. This old pimp, he played three. His friends are homies, dogs and G's. This old pimp, he played four. He got chin checked, hit the floor. This old pimp, he played five. Boy got smoke means not alive. I mean, it went on and on. And by the end, I mean, I was in tears. Wow, and man. then they're like, man, you, you, you know, you, you crying, you gay. They always do that. But what happened was these guys that had hated each other who started laughing together. They're laughing at me. We're all laughing together. Yeah. And that's when the learning began is all of a sudden we had something in common. And that's the power of comedy. That's the power of music. I'm just trying to, what is it? I'm always looking at every kid's a little bit different. What is it that pushes this kid's button? We'll figure out what it is. There's something she's in. I mean, I used to volunteer at a juvenile detention facility for teenage girls. And they're like, oh, you're never going to get through these girls. And it only took me a week, Hirsch. I mean, uh, I, I used, uh, they wouldn't read anything. So I got them Us Magazine. In the back of Us Magazine, there's a thing called the Fashion Police, where it's all these comedians ripping out celebrity outfits. And these right. girls couldn't get enough of it. They're like, oh, man, look at, oh, girl. You know I mean? They're going out. And that's what got them reading, was they like the put-downs. You know, I've gotten people... 
I've worked with kids. I had a high school junior and they said, no, he'll never read anything. And so I just gave him hip hop lyrics and he just started reading songs by, you know, all these different rap artists. And then he started creating his own raps and I'd always make sure to have class time so he could do it for the rest of the kids. And that built up his self-esteem and he started, then he would actually start reading some of the other things we were trying to read. But I'm like, you know, before I get him reading Shakespeare, I got to connect him to something. I need to figure out what it is that turns this kid on. When I was a kid, I wasn't a reader as a kid. It, as, it, as it happens, I evolved into a reader as a, the older I got, the more I've read. But really it was, I was a writer. And I also loved movies yeah, and yeah, yeah. TV shows. And I memorized all of that. And then I would write it out as like plays to do with my friends or everything always involved writing and then performing it or having it be recreated. But I cheated on all my book reports. My grandmother, who was a voracious reader, read the books oh, wow. and dictated my book reports to me, knowing that, <laughs> knowing that I would eventually come around to it. And I was far from illiterate. I I had memorized, you know, I was in the Wizard of Oz a play in second grade and I played the Scarecrow, but I had memorized the entire movie and the script nice. for the show was the same as the movie. And, but, but it came from this imagination point of view. Like if you see a book, you're like, oh, well, that's already written. There's nothing, mm. there's nothing magical about it. It's, it's already there. And that's, I think, what was in my head. And only later did I start to, you know, read like... Yeah. Stephen King or something. When I read The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy by Douglas Adams, that was the first book where I had to stop on almost yeah. every page because I was laughing so hard. He was just brilliant. Or of the classics I yeah. was ever forced to read, when that when I read Catcher in the Rye, I just thought, Catcher in the Rye, the Holden Caulfield character, um, there's two points in that book that made me laugh. But the one that really stood out was uh, he always hated his high school because F.U. was written on everything. There's graffiti everywhere. And then they take this field trip to the Metropolitan History Museum in New York City, and he goes into the Egyptian tombs, and he's all alone. He's away from the madness of his high school, and he's like, man, I'm finally at peace. And he looks up, and somebody in the inside of the pyramids written F you. <laughs> <laughs> that just made me laugh so hard. I just thought, wow, this is, <laughs> this is fantastic. And, and that's where I, I'm always looking. I, I mean, I think life's too short. I need to laugh as much as possible. I, that's why I stopped watching the news. I'll watch, I'll watch comedians yeah. give me their take on the news. But, uh, you know, the news is very depressing. <laughs> I, want to, I want to hear the humorous take on it. <laughs> well, speaking of that, how in touch with what's going on in the rest of the world are the students that you know you're you yeah, find I mean, yourself are, addressing i you know our previous president unfortunately my kids knew all about him because he wanted to be in the news every single day and i'm like gosh i don't think kids should really i don't know if i want to be interested in politics let alone like be interested in <laughs> politics i mean yeah. i think it's important though you know, kids are amazing i like i was i was speaking at an event and there was this 17 year old kid and she gave this great speech about climate change, about, um, and it had nothing to do, her entire speech was why you should go vegan. And it was the most incredible environmental speech I've ever heard in my life. She's like, if everybody would go vegan for one day a week, we could do, I mean, she was showing the environmental benefits and she basically said, you know, it takes, I remember the speech so well. She was, she's like, well, it takes, it takes six, six gallons of water, for to to get a pound of carrots it takes 2800 gallons of water for a pound of beef and then so the water so then she's she's like and then to transport that beef this much diesel goes into the atmosphere you know i mean it was unbelievable and i and she was just basically arguing she's like i know right, not right. everybody can go vegan but if you just did it one day a week went plant based for one day a week how much you could reverse a lot of environmental damage that we're doing. And I was like, this is where I love kids. I was like, wow, it, it got me thinking. I, I And I, I actually love schools because in sc schools are much different than society. Because in society, we're not allowed to talk about anything controversial anymore. If, if people have different points of view, they just demonize one another. Whereas in yeah. school, I, I actually, you know, I used to teach history. And the first thing I teach kids in history is, you know, history books are usually written by the winners. Every event in history, 
has multiple points of view. And in this class, my job is to teach you how to think, not what to think. You know, and I, I actually encourage us to have these these conversations yeah. where, hey, let's play devil's advocate. You know, and I love that about and kids are great. Kids are much more. Uh, I actually wrote a letter to the L.A. Times. They didn't publish it because they're stupid. They basically there was a, this story I read. <laughs> it said that the president and Congress were behaving like children. And the gist of my letter to the editor was like, that is such an insult to children because the beautiful thing about yeah, the beautiful thing about kids, Hirsch, is they right. get over it. I mean, they get in fights, and like 10 minutes later, they're like, this is my best friend. And I mean, I love that with kids. It's adults that hold these grudges. It's adults that show this behavior, which is completely unsuitable to curiosity and learning. And that's why I think school, there's a great line in E.T. where uh, they, the brother asks Elliot if, if he's going to take E.T. To, to school. And he's like, how do you explain school to a, to a higher life form? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, isn't that brilliant? Isn't that brilliant? So Danny, with with corporate clients and groups that you speak to, tell tell us a little bit about the parallel between reading yeah. and success. Yeah, I mean, there's and reading uh, and there's leadership. plenty of readers that not, might not become effective leaders, but Hirsch, I have never ever read about an effective leader who was not also a very avid reader. I mean, we can look at everything. Like if you want to look at business people, Elon Musk to this day reads at least one book a day. Warren Buffett spends his entire day, every single day for 10 hours in his office, reading reports about different companies. You know, you can look at uh, in the military, all of these guys, if they're a four or five star general, they are, I mean, Schwartz, General Schwarzkopf could quote Shakespeare with no problem. He could speak in four languages. Even like athletes, I could have kissed LeBron James when the uh, when he was playing for the Miami Heat before the finals. Once they showed him in the locker room reading the Hunger Games by Suzanne Collins, and I could have kissed the man Hirsch because I'm like that picture <laughs> just did more to get kids interested in reading than anything I will ever do. Entertainment, you know, show me any actor that doesn't read; they have to read scripts constantly. I mean, and then you even have like this is one of the interesting things I've done in my research is over. Over half of the Fortune 500 CEOs in the world are actually dyslexic. And this is an interesting thing I point out to people. Like dyslexia, there's lots of different reading disabilities, and people have to understand that every reading disability is curable. Dyslexia is by far and away the most undiagnosed reading disability out there. And what people don't understand with dyslexics is dyslexics are usually good auditory learners. And I always tell people the research is very clear on this. It's just as effective listening to, to books as it is reading them on your own. And so when people tell me they, they don't have time to read, first of all, people say, oh, I have no time to read. I'm like, yeah, who has time to read when you're watching? You can watch the game on TV, have a couple of beers, go out shopping. I mean, there's no such thing as time management, only priority management. But I'm like, hey, instead of listening to some negative talk radio on your way to work, why don't you listen to a book on tape? I mean, if you're, if you're doing a half hour commute every day, you can usually get through an audio book easily at least one a month. So that's 12, 12 books a year that you're going through. And I always tell people, I mean, now there's so many different apps for free online where you can download books for free from different public libraries. I mean, I just listened to, um, I've listened to just in the last couple of weeks the the Malcolm Gladwell his his Talking with Strangers book is a really good audio book. I listened to Will Smith's autobiography. It's very different listening to that after his whole. But it's interesting listening. Yeah, to, right. It's one of the things when I'm talking to parents, I always say, you know, the research is very clear. On, I mean, I'm one of these people that's I, I've nerded out and I have actually read every government report on reading in the last hundred years. You know, and they're always about two thousand pages long. There's always around page 100, there's a single paragraph that says, the research seems to suggest the single best way to improve reading is to read aloud to children. And then they never mention it again because that, that doesn't cost any money. It's so easy to do. And so <laughs> when I'm talking to executives, I talk to executives the same way as I talk to kindergartners is what, what turns you on? I mean... What will what will help you? And I often say, you know, um, I think it was Norman Mailer that, that always talked about the importance of reading fiction as well as nonfiction to help you, because a lot of our best ideas are drawn from other things. You know, just because you're you're running some tech company doesn't mean if you're not reading like you can't read an Isaac Asimov book and be like, huh, that's an interesting take on artificial intelligence. Maybe how can we apply that concept to this? I mean, that, that, that's what I'm talking about. 
<clears throat> when I'm talking to corporate leaders is, you know, how are you going to get better? Do you know anything about your competition? Why don't you look back? I mean, one of the points I was making the other day was uh, we're talking about climate change and environmental crises. And I said, you know, I've always been an optimist. And 100 years ago, there was a horrible, a horrible environmental crisis because horses, everything was horse drawn back then. And horses, their manure was creating so much methane gas, it was destroying the ozone, and then the urine was destroying streets and everything, and then horses would die. There was all kinds of environment. And it was, a, it was a complete crisis. And one man solved the environmental crisis. His name was Henry Ford, and he invented the automobile. You know, and now, now automobiles <laughs> are creating all kinds of problems, but yeah. I have faith in humanity that somebody is going to solve this problem. Somebody will figure out a way. I mean, believe me, look at, and here's a perfect example. What if a virus spread around the planet? What would we do? Could we even survive? Of course we could. It was un unbelievable. I hear people griping about Zoom and I'm like, okay, you can gripe about Zoom all you yeah. want. Can you imagine going through the pandemic without Zoom? I mean, at least we were able to still communicate with people. And that, that that was my point before with the technology being our being more our friend if we choose to make it so or when we choose yeah. to make it so or be responsible about it fiction the flip side of fiction is that fiction yeah. is where we get all our great ideas that's what fiction is we thought of it before it got made and then all of a sudden it's a reality so fiction is even more gratifying now because the line between truth and and fiction is is blurred so much and there are so many forces at work out there disinforming us or yeah. or informing us with with extreme bias and so fiction is like it's yeah, fair game absolutely. it's like okay let's treat it as fiction and see what we can learn from it let's let's learn from fiction and then we'll we'll discover reality together what is the single most important actionable item on your list like if you if you could say i just i just spoke with you know, I just spoke to a group or I just did this interview with Hirsch. I hope that somebody out there listening gets one one point. What's yeah, the, the golden, golden point? point that's, thank you for that, that you, Hirsch. That I, I think motivation make. is key. What is it that motivates you and how can we incorporate sure. reading into that motivation? You know, this is this is how I get people excited about reading. Uh, you know, I had a friend who wanted to write a parable. I'm like, well, if you want to write a parable, here's an idea. Maybe you should read other people's parables and that will give you ideas on how to write a parable better. You know, if you want to be a, you know, if you want to be a comedian, you should read about other comedians. What, do, what are the habits of those comedians? What do they do? do? I mean, I know that you get, I mean, any good comedian sitting there every single day writing jokes, they're trying to figure out, well, how is this funny? I mean, I, I always just, you, you look at people like Jimmy Kimmel and Jimmy Fallon and, and Stephen Colbert. I mean, these people have at least a dozen writers. I mean, every single day they have to come up with a 10 minute monologue. And I mean, it takes, that's a lot of hard work. How do you keep this interesting? And how do you write jokes for this specific person? You know, one of the things I do is I'll fly out to executives and for two days we walk and talk for two days and we basically craft their signature talk. They're looking for a way to create a speech or to create their book. I'm like, okay, well, let's, here's how we'll structure it, but I have to find out what your stories are. Everybody has stories. And so if we really want to succeed in life, we need to, well, what is it that makes successful people successful? That's why I read biographies constantly. I'm constantly, uh, and often it's a bummer. Like I just read a book on uh, yeah. Walter Payton was one of my favorite football players of all time. I read uh, Sweetness by Jeff Perlman. The reason I bought the book was that I'm a huge Laker fan and they just did this great show on HBO about the Lakers winning time. And I tried to buy the book by Jeff oh, Perlman, yeah. but it was sold out. And so right. then I saw his other books. I'm like, oh, he's got a book called Sweetness on Walter Payton. And... Walter Payton had all the things that I loved about him, but reading this book, this is the, the danger about reading about your idols. He was also a scumbag in other areas of his life. And I'm like, oh, I just read a book on, um, I read a book, uh, it's part of a trilogy yeah. on uh, uh, President Johnson, LBJ, by Robert Caro. And gosh, I was like, oh, oh. I mean, he did, he, and it's, I mean, he's a human being. I mean, this, this is the thing that people have to understand is, I mean, I guess, they write a biography on me. Yeah. Somebody is going to come on your podcast. Man, I thought Danny was cool, but then I read about this period in his life, man. You know, <laughs> it's like, oh, well. Right, right. We learn to not to judge 
people on the some, you know, on their failures, people write autobiographies and they cop to a lot of their failures. And they, you know, the question is like anything else, same as with check technology. What do we learn from it? What do we learn from our mistake? You know, what, what, did, what are we not going to do next time? we have a chance or what are we going to read about someone we admire and they failed at a certain part of life and you learn a lot about you know being well rounded and trying to round out your experiences and your knowledge i love reading about successful people at their lowest points well what was you know you, i mean Jerry Seinfeld didn't kill it the first night yeah. he was on stage like i read jay leno's biography was fascinating was uh, you know jay leno Man, that guy, I don't know where he gets the strength and energy. I mean, he, he just worked his butt off. I mean, he would do routines. He worked at, like, mental facilities <laughs> and prisons. and I mean, he would do his stand-up anywhere. I right. mean, and that's what you look at these guys. Like, oh, wow, what a great success. I love reading about people. Is it, That's the thing about reading. And I, I, I did want to, as a, a thank you for having me on, Hirsch, for your audience, for bearing with me, I did want to give everybody a couple of freebies. So if you go to freegiftfromdanny.com, freegiftfromdanny.com. I'm going to give everybody an e-copy of my book, Read, Lead, and Succeed, which is a book. I wrote it for a school principal who was trying to keep his, his faculty positively engaged. So I said, okay, I'll write you a book. So every week I give you a concept, an inspirational quote, an inspirational story, a book recommendation on a book you should read, but you're probably too lazy because you're an adult. So I also give you a children's picture book recommendation that you can read that in five minutes. It demonstrates the same concept because we need to keep people more positive. I, I'm sick of the negativity in the world. And then I'm also going to give everybody access to a five-day reading challenge I did last summer for about 700 parents online. So every day for five consecutive days, you get an hour of me giving you ideas on ways to not just get your kids excited about reading, but to get you excited about reading. Thanks so much for tuning into Truth Tastes Funny. If you enjoyed the experience, please leave a five-star review and share this podcast with your friends.